Good morning. It is an absolutely beautiful morning, considerably less windy than the last couple of days and the sun is shining. As you can probably see, I'm squinting slightly. It's right in my eyes. I'm hoping to do about 12 miles today and two locks. And now that I'm on the proper Trent, rather than the canally Trent bit that goes through Nottingham, I believe it's now uh, that the locks are fully manned and fully automated, where I had to operate the ones in Nottingham myself. So it should just be a case of rocking up. They see you, open it up, and you go in. And don't really have to do anything. 12 miles would normally be a fair journey on the canal at two to three miles an hour, but I'm on a river going downstream. I can open up the throttle a bit. I think even if I just do five miles an hour, that's just over two hours of actual motoring. So hopefully a civilized journey today. I was moored, you may recall, above Home Lock, so the first thing to do was go in there and down 12 feet. But the lights were at red and didn't change even though I approached very slowly, hoping the lock keeper would have it ready by the time I got there. I ended up tying up and going in search of the locky, who'd wandered off elsewhere round the site. Look, there I am on the gates. Soon the lock was open and the lights at green, so I could move into the chamber. They like you to tie your centre line round these vertical poles so as to be able to hold the boat to the wall while it descends. It can be a bit awkward looping the rope round while you're single-handed, but I haven't fallen in yet. I had to wait a few more minutes though, as another boat was approaching and it made sense for us both to go in the lock together. The lockies get these rather nice little sheds to work out of, which house the lock controls. It's all mechanised and hydraulic rams push the gates open and shut at the touch of a button. This has been speeded up just under 10 times. Leaving the lock means gently edging forward as I retrieve the centre line from around the pole. Then the boat is free to proceed. I let the other boat go first and he didn't hang about. Although it didn't really make a difference as he ended up waiting for me at the next one. Look at the swirling torrent from the Whitewater kayak course which rejoins the river here too. Like many rivers, there's not a lot to see along the banks, as it's largely open fields and agricultural land. But I did smile at this graffiti. Yes, I know, me enjoying graffiti. What has the world come to? And, ah, a heron, a pleasure to see as always. Look at that rev counter. It's never seen so many revs. I was nearly at infinite improbability and worried the boat might turn into a pot of petunias. Eight miles an hour is the downstream limit and I later worked out I was only doing six, even though the banks were whizzing by in a dizzying blur. I approached the Radcliffe Viaduct, a railway bridge, and wasn't sure which arch I was supposed to take. 
It was the dilemma of play school's windows all over again. Think, David, think. What would Humpty do? I went for the biggest. At the far end, men were dangling from a terrifying-looking contraption, seemingly doing some kind of repairs to the brickwork. Also known as Rectory Junction Viaduct, it's Grade 2 listed, opened in 1850, and the approach is around 700 feet of brick archways. I did say there's not much else to look at. From home lock to the next, Stoke lock, is a mere five kilometres, or as we know it in real money, just over three miles. Note the visitor moorings on the left. Most, if not all, of the locks seem to have moorings, as that's about the only place you can stop on the river. The other boat was waiting patiently for me in the lock. He said he'd had enough time to put the kettle on and have a brew before I arrived, but he also seemed entirely pleased with this, so no problem. On the lock side is the keeper, noting down my boat name and licence number for their records. He has a rather splendid tree house for his hut. The procedure was the same. Hold on tight while the buttons are pressed, and we went down by just seven feet this time. Nope, no idea how fast that is. This kilometre fixation on the river is most vexing. Well, according to the lockkeeper here, there's quite the sandbar. Just as you exit the lock, they've got some boys marking where you're supposed to go, and I'm going to follow the boat ahead because he's been given detailed instructions. Such instructions turned out to be entirely unnecessary, since the colossal sandbank was visible even without the markers. As long as you go straight ahead when leaving the lock, you're fine. Then you can veer back over to the right side. Once again, my travelling companion vanished into the distance. It turned out he's a professional boat mover who was transporting that narrowboat up north. As I passed these cows, they gently shifted as if assembling to move into the water and swim after me like hippos on the rampage. For a moment I was quaking in my trainers, but the beastly bovines did not in fact venture out. I have decided I need to install a hydraulically extendable seat so I can sit and steer at this height. The view is amazing. Does anyone remember the tripods stalking across England? I'm aware these are monopods, but I get the same vibe. Gunthorpe Bridge meant I was nearing the next lock, Gunthorpe Lock, next to Gunthorpe Weir, just after Gunthorpe Marina. There's a logic to this system, you know. An excellent length of visitor moorings here for any passing boater, not just pub patrons. And then those are some hire boats.
another tentacled sign tells you where to point the boat. And just before we get there, some floating candy, a feast for the eyes, which I will let play for a bit. Once again, I was relatively tardy into the lock compared with that other boat, but he was very amiable about the wait and we were soon through. Dodging icebergs on the other side, no sign of Rose or Jack. I really quite fancy one of those. The boat, not the cow on the bank, just so we're clear. The sheep were enjoying a quick game of hide and seek. I was very quiet so as not to give them away. According to my guidebook, the bank on the right rises to about 200 feet tall. I'm not entirely sure I'd buy that. There's an RAF base over there, and their planes kept doing this. It was disturbing. Having just passed the 21 kilometer marker point, there are now three kilometres until I get to my stop for today, which is Hazelford Lock. I don't know who these moorings belong to, but there's a lot of lovely boats to gawp at. At the final lock for this day, we both had to wait as another boat was coming up. Look at this thing. Apparently it can and does move occasionally, though I'd assumed it had sunk. The little brick building is a facilities point, which all the locks seem to have. It's very convenient. I wish the canals were like that. Below the lock, there's what appear to be the remains of a Roman amphitheatre. Ah, just kidding. It's moorings, and I tied up there for the night and slept to the whoosh of the weir. Cheerio.